Say what? Ladies and gentlemen, we're calling the meeting to order of the subcommittee on East Side Fun, Games, Childhood Activities, Nanas, Blankies, Pesto, Chocolate Ice Cream, and also uh, trucks and toys. Um, uh, to be debated today is whether we believe these things, sh we should have more or less of these things. Should we have more chocolate, trucks, pesto, nanas, blankies, and other things that we like, or less? First to speak today will be Council Member Asher Gorodnik from the top bunk. What would you like to say about these things? No, and I already have enough stuffed animals, toys, and chocolate, and chocolate makes my belly hurt, so no. Oh, ah, so taking the no position is Councilmember Asher Gorodnik, who believes that chocolate makes his belly hurt, and also he has enough toys. Uh, Councilmember Devin Gorodnik, what would you like? Would you like more of those things or less of those things? Best of those things. Tell me why. Uh, um, whoever likes ice cream, they can come to my birthday, because my birthday's in a few days. Really? When is your birthday? Uh, September 10th. September 10th is your birthday? Yes. And so why, are you, why do you want less chocolate and candy and trucks and nanas and blankies? Because um, um, sometimes I'm a little allergic of ice cream. You're allergic to ice cream or are you allergic to uh, stuffed animals? Yes, definitely. Stuffed animals. Okay, uh, Council Member Asher Gorodnik, do you have anything more to say on that subject? Turn your microphone on. I have to say ice cream, chocolate, nanas, blankies, toys, that's pretty good. But just chocolate, it's, it's like really, it's, it makes me really like, Sick to your stomach? Yeah. Would you like to make amendment to...
The reporters know that the people sleep on my cat sleeps on my face. Yeah, and my son. Good guy sleeps in the bed, trying to get him out. It's an so everyday New Yorker job. Yeah. <laughs> Off the record, while the microphone's on, first, tell 
Interestingly enough, there are no trivial pursuit questions on the internet. I thought I could ask a trivial pursuit question, and I can't find one. So not to turn the tables, but uh, the lowest natural temperature ever directly recorded at ground level was measured on what continent? 
That is correct. What, did, what was it? There you go. Okay. Which one of the seven ancient wonders of the world is still standing today? Pyramid. That is correct. <laughs> Orson Welles. Two Orson Welles provided the voice of which Transformer in the Transformers movie released in 1986? That What's is incorrect. What's the name of the new Star Wars movie? <laughs> what? That is incorrect. That is incorrect. Nope. Nope. The villain. He, he plays the villain. Nope. There is a world-eating villain. Uh, the correct answer is Unicron. <laughs> All righty, let's go with shrimp for a second. What direction do shrimp swim in? What direction? You got it. Okay, keep going. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Fans of Taylor Swift are known as what? Swift. <laughs> We're doing trivia, speaker. Huh? We would start a trivia. Fans of Taylor Swift I'm getting a lot of... <laughs> okay. This I don't know if fit here. Okay. We're going to quickly start and... Good job. Um, <laughs> uh, Rosie is not is here. Of course, is she going to... Is Rosie here? Because we her bill we're going to discuss. Okay. So we are being joined by Council Members Drum, Yudani, Rodriguez. Richie Torres, Helen Rosenthal, Debbie Rose, Ben Kalos, and Donovan Richards. All right, so as everybody knows, I think I'm getting some nice music in the background. So uh, today is my final stated meeting as speaker. Uh, this has been the most productive council this city has ever seen, and I am proud of all that we have accomplished together, and I want to thank my colleagues in particular. Uh, our record of passing groundbreaking legislation continues today. The council is going to vote on a number of land use items, including the development of the National Black Theater in Manhattan, the rezoning of 1965 Lafayette Avenue in the Bronx, and the self-storage text amendment that applies to various districts throughout the city. Council will also vote on legislation concerning uh, runaway youth. Introduction 1705A, sponsored by Council Member Rafael Salamanca, would require DHS and DYCD to create and maintain a process for conducting intake and assessments for any runaway or homeless youth who is seeking, I think we're gonna have to close out. So. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start, you know, like, yeah. No, not that. My cadence is gonna start, you know, going with the music. Um, <laughs> I are the tiger. Very appropriate right now. That doesn't do anything. All right, so we'll keep going. Introduction 1619A, sponsored by Council Member Corey Johnson, would require DYCD to provide a biannual report on the number of runaway youth and homeless youth who were not able to access runaway and homeless youth shelters. And uh, he could not join us today, so we thank him for the piece of legislation. Next, we're going to vote on a few transportation bills. Introduction 1658, sponsored by Council Member Idanis Rodriguez, would require the Department of Transportation and the Parks Department to report annually on the number of bollards installed throughout the city. Introduction 1397A, sponsored by Council Member Steve Mario, would set out conditions which may apply when a permit is issued to cut open a street within five years or less after completion of a city capital construction project which required resurfacing or reconstruction of the street. Min Minority Leader Mario can be here today, but I definitely invite the Chair of Transportation Committee, uh, Idanis, to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Speaker. After the, <laughs> after the previous terror, terror attack using vehicles or as weapons of mass destruction in major cities in France, Berlin, London, Sweden, and Barcelona, and the Halloween terrorist attack this year in New York City when a terrorist drove into the Hudson River Greenway killing eight people and injuring 11 others, I have been fighting to expand more pedestrian safety bowlers to, sorry. I have been fighting to expand more pedestrian safety bowlers to protect our city from the use of vehicles as weapons of mass destruction. It doesn't make sense that we have pedestrian bowlers at 46, 42nd and 6th Avenue across the Bank of America 
but there's no pedestrian bowlers across the theater at 42nd between 7 and 8. After the downtown terrorist attack, we have learned that, lesson, that the lesson that pedestrian bowlers should be installed in any sidewalk with a high volume of pedestrians and cyclists. Long before the Times Square and World Trade Center terrorist attack occurred, I asked the city for a stronger safety measurements to secure pedestrians. With this bill, we show one more time our commitment in making New York City safer for everyone. Introduction 1658-A will require the administration to report to the council every year about the installation of sidewalk bowlers throughout the city. I'm going to keep working hard to make sure that we expand installation of bowlers on Vision Zero corridors in front of schools, plazas, cultures, and other institutions to, expand, to be expanded as soon as possible. We must use pedestrian safety bowlers and other tools to continue making our city the safest one in New York City. Thank you. Next, council will vote on intro 1466, sponsored by Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bramer, and that would require the Department of Parks and Recreation to clean place playground equipment after the spraying of pesticides. Uh, so I want to ask Councilmember Member Bramer to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, indeed, 1466 is, I believe, an important common sense measure to make sure that children are safe uh, and parents have peace of mind when their youngsters are in playgrounds. Uh, this legislation came about because parents of young children came to our office uh, and complained about finding layers of sludge uh, and liquid left behind uh, on park playground equipment after the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, used pesticides uh, during spraying events. Obviously, they were concerned about uh, the cleanliness of the equipment and so we came up with intro 1466, which calls upon the Parks Department to, in coordination with the Department of Health, clean playground equipment in city parks within 24 hours of an aerial spraying of pesticides uh, by any city agency. And we would also uh, ask for uh, and require DOHMH and the Parks Department to establish specific rules and measurements of distance from which pesticide spraying occurs sure that playground equipment will not be exposed su to such pesticides. Uh, when using park playgrounds and play equipment, obviously young children in particular, uh, their skin, their lungs, uh, they're touching things and then also touching their mouths, their eyes, they're exposed to these uh, potential uh, toxins. So making sure that we're wiping down and cleaning all this equipment within 24 hours of any spraying event, particularly for West Nile virus, is a common sense measure, again, to protect the health of all children, particularly young children in our parks playgrounds, and also to make sure that all the parents, including the ones who wrote to my office, have peace of mind when their youngsters are playing in city parks. Thank you very Thank much. You. Moving on, we're going to vote on a number of bills sponsored by Housing and Buildings Committee Chair Jamani Williams. Intro 1128 would require that the Department of Environmental Protection be notified whenever excavation or drilling to a depth greater than 50 feet is proposed in the Bronx or north of 135th Street in Manhattan or greater than 100 feet elsewhere in the city. And intro 1039A would require the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to report on the vacant buildings that may be suitable for the development of affordable housing. Also, the council will vote on intro 1036A sponsored by Council Member Idanis Rodriguez, which would require the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to conduct an, an analysis of vacant residential buildings and vacant lots. And finally, intro 1269A, sponsored by Council Member Donovan Richards, would require the Department of Housing and Buildings to enter into regulatory agreements with community land trusts. Uh, I would like to ask Council Members Rodriguez and Richards to speak on their respective bills. Thank you, Speaker, one more time. We can and, sh and we should use all vacant land in New York City to build 100% affordable housing. Intro 1036-A aim to reduce the number of homeless in New York City, which is the biggest homeless crisis in the history. Introduction 1036-A will require the mayor or agency designated by the mayor to conduct an annual census of vacant properties in coordination with the Departments of Housing Preservation of Development, the Departments of Environmental Protection, 
the departments of buildings, the departments of sanitation, the fire departments, and any other relevant agency. The mayor or designated agency will also be required to compile a list of vacant properties as a result of the census. As, as, they ask, as, a, as, a, as we are dealing with a homeless population crisis, it is time for you to use that line. Hoy nosotros estamos pasando esta ley que busca establecer de que to, se haga un censo de toda la tierra que le pertenece a la ciudad que no se esté utilizando. Yo espero que toda esa tierra sea utilizado para construirse vivienda asequible 100% para la clase trabajadora. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Today we take a critical step towards uh, taking the power away from speculators give, and giving land back to local communities and nonprofits that serve them. Intro 1269 will not only define community land trusts for the first time in New York City law, but it will also require that the community land trust enters into a 99-year ground lease agreement ensuring land trust will, ensuring land will remain affordable for generations to come. In order to fully grow and flourish as a city, we need to not only build affordable housing, but we must also increase opportunities for affordable home ownership. While this model has substantial benefits for both rentals and ownership, it's one of the few tools in the shed that can directly address the home ownership needs of many communities across the city. I'd like to thank our speaker, Melissa Marcarito, and congratulate her on a successful four years, Jen Wilcox and Megan Chen from our legislative division, the Coalition for Affordable Homes, the New York City Community Land Trust Initiative, and especially my legislative director, Jordan Gibbons, Matt Dunbar, and also uh, Laura Popa. Thank you. Also voting on intro 1015A, sponsored by Councilmember Van Kalos, which would require HPD to establish a housing portal. Uh, I'll leave it right there and ask Councilmember Kalos to speak to that. Residents call my office every day looking for affordable housing. With hundreds of thousands of affordable housing units, uh, some people keep talking about, one would think that residents might actually get it. Uh, thanks to a hero and whistleblower at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Steve Werner, we learned through ProPublica Pro that about 50,000 units of affordable housing were not being registered with the state, which meant landlords might be receiving an estimated $100 million uh, from taxpayers that might not be offering as affordable housing they promised. This legislation will require all new and existing city subsidized affordable housing to register annually or face escalating fines, offer new and for the first time existing affordable housing units through Housing Connect and provides transparency around these affordable units and who manages them. Thank you to ProPublica, the whistleblower at, and HPD analyst Steve Werner, OSA President Robert Crohan for protecting his members' whistleblower rights, Housing Chair and co-sponsor Jamani Williams, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, Housing Advocates at Urban Justice Center and Tenants and Neighbors, Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, and oh my God to the legislative team, Jeff Baker, Ed Akin, Megan Chen for a very tough, but I might add successful negotiation. Thank you, Ben. In addition, we're gonna be voting on legislation by the public advocate to exchange intro 1009A would require HPD to create an online database for registering dwellings containing an owner's information. Moving on, the council will vote on intro 385C sponsored by council member Rosie Mendez which requires dwelling owners to annually inspect units for indoor allergen hazards. <coughs> also gonna vote on bill sponsored by General Welfare Committee Chair Steve Levin, intro 1739A, would require HRA to issue an annual report on the number of individuals and the number of families who exit domestic violence emergency shelters. Intro 1714A requires educational continuity materials and information be provided to families with children applying for shelters. And intro 1577A will require the Mayor's Office of Operations to complete a study on client information management systems. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Reynoso and nobody else came in, right? Okay. Also, we're gonna vote on intro 855B, sponsored by Council Member Ben Kalos. It will require the Mayor's Office of Operations to produce a study regarding the feasibility of notifying individuals who apply for public assistance about other assistance opportunities. And I, again, I invite Council Member Kalos um, to say a few words. Fast. Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Historic. Oh my God. 
but to be honest, I mean, when we were talking about this bill, it was I was actually excited about it because many of us couldn't believe that this isn't already being done, right? That if somebody comes and asks for some guidance, is applying for public assistance in any way, that they be told of what other services they may be eligible. So that's really smart. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, we're going to also vote on Intro 572A, sponsored by Councilmember Liz Crowley, which would require Department of Homeless Services to post a daily report Monday through Friday on its website with information on the daily shelter census. The council will also vote on intro 1632A, sponsored by Councilmember Dan Gorodnik, which would require that property owners post the information about a building's energy efficiency in a conspicuous place. Next, the council will vote on a couple of bills sponsored by Environmental Protection Chair Costa Constantinidis. Intro 54A would request, I'm sorry, would use uh, the use of alternative fuels and alternative fuel technologies in the city ferry fleet uh, would actually report on the use of alternative fuels and alternative fuel technologies in the city ferry fleet. Intro 1629A would require the Department of Buildings to submit proposed amendments to make the city's energy code match the model stretch energy code created by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. We want to thank Constantinidis for that. Also voting on intro 1465A, sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres, which would accelerate the timeline for such plants to shift from using higher grade fuel oil. Intro 978D, also sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres, would, would establish uh, minimum standards for carrying out mold assessment, mold abatement, and mold remediation for certain buildings. You want to speak on either of these two bills? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Moving on, the council will vote on intro 717A, sponsored by council member Helen Rosenthal, which would require reporting on idling complaints and their dispositions. We're going to also vote on another bill sponsored by council member Rosenthal, intro 880A, which would require a review of the use of biodiesel fuel in school buses. And I ask Helen to come up and speak on both those issues. Thank you. I'm relieved that I can speak. Uh, today the City Council is passing two of my bills which will help improve air quality for every New Yorker and puts us further on the path towards a sustainable city. Every year idling in New York City generates hundreds of thousands of tons of dangerous pollutants that threaten our health and fuel climate and fuel climate change. Yet idling is rampant across our city. My bill intro 177 717 will make it far easier for New Yorkers to file air quality complaints against commercial vehicles and tour buses that are idling in their communities and be fiscally uh, compensated for their time. Um, the city will be required to report to the public on idling complaints and the results and best of all, the Department of Health has agreed to carry out a public education campaign about the impacts of idling. Make no mistake, we have a long way to go in terms of stopping idling, but we're well on our way. My second bill, Intro 880, requires the Department of Education to conduct a study on air quality impacts of switching the fuel used by school buses from diesel to biodiesel. The study will set us on a path toward more efficient and environmentally friendly transportation for our school children. Both of these bills are good for the environment, public health, and civic engagement. I'm grateful for the work of advocates, the committee council, Samara Swanson in particular, uh, and my colleagues, which enabled us to pass these bills. And uh, lastly, I just want to congratulate the speaker on her four successful years leading this body. Next, we're going to vote on intro 1653B, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, which would require DEP to establish response times for after-hours noise complaints and lower the noise level allowed for after-hours construction without DEP sign-off. I want to invite Councilmember Kalos to speak on this bill. New York City may be the city that never sleeps, but that shouldn't be because of after-hours construction that wakes you up. Uh, noise is the top complaint in New York City with booming construction surrounding residents who complain only to see their concerns go unaddressed for days or met with a small fine paid by developers as a cost of doing business. 
after hours noise will be targeted with new rules for responding when noise is still happening or is likely to occur again, turning down the volume on after hours construction noise in residential neighborhoods over the next two years and empowering the Department of Environmental Protection to shut down equipment that is too loud. Uh, I want to thank the Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner Vincent Sapienza for his agency's partnership, Environmental Committee Chair Casa Constantinides for his co-sponsorship and support, Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito for standing up to pretty much everyone in support of our residents in the city, and to Jen Wilcox and Samara Swanson for the hard work drafting and negotiating this legislation. I just want to uh, echo uh, my colleague's sentiments. Uh, there is a lot that we got done that we couldn't have ever gotten done without you as speaker. And I, uh, I, there, there is no one like you, and there will never be anybody like you. Thank you. Um, just trying to find something, but I don't know what I did with it. Um, okay, the council is going to also vote on intro 1616A, sponsored by council member Danny Drum which would create a temporary task force to address re-entry issues that older adults face when returning from state prisons and local jails. Uh, Council Member Drum has been a leader on all of these issues. I really uh, thank him for his leadership and ask him to say a few words. Thank you very much, Speaker. Mark Viverito and I too am very proud to have been here in this council with you over the last four years. Uh, your leadership has been exemplary and um, I congratulate you and thank you for all that you've done. It's an emotional moment for all of us in the city council. I just want you to imagine for a minute what it would be like to be 65 years old, having spent 20 years in prison, and you are returned to New York without any resources whatsoever. You don't know where to go for housing, you have no money for transportation, your health needs aren't being met, what do you do? With an unprecedented number of currently incarcerated older people in New York State prisons, more than 10,000 people aged 50 and older, and state and federal prisons across the country, strong community pressure from the Release Aging People in Prison, RAP campaign, and others is resulting in changes to New York State Parole Board and an increase in the number of elders released from prison in New York. However, both the city and state currently do little to support older people once they are released. Older people returning home face particular barriers in seeking employment, community resources, health care, reconnecting with family, and especially getting housing. In 2016, 58% of older people, 1,699 people, were homeless upon release from a New York State prison, and nearly 1,200 went directly to a homeless shelter. Such, a st such unstable housing placements offer little to no age-appropriate safe and secure support and care for recently released older people with unique difficulties and needs. Therefore, for many elders leaving prison, the human right to sufficient, sustainable, and appropriate housing and community resources remains unmet. This task force will be designed to address those issues. It will be made up of eight people from the administration, four from the council, but most importantly, of the eight people that the mayor will assign to the task force three of those people will be formally incarcerated who know what it's like to go through that system. Thank you very Thank much. You, Next council will vote on entry 1185A, sponsored by council member Heim Deutsch, which would require DIFTA to regularly provide written materials from OEM to senior centers and NORCs on how to register with a utility company if you use life-sustaining medical equipment or are an individual for whom a disruption an electrical service would create a medical emergency. I want to thank Council Member Deutsch for that. In addition, Council will vote on intro 1399A, sponsored by Council Member Debbie, Debbie Rose, which would protect employees who seek temporary changes to work schedules for personal events and certain other scheduled changes. And I ask Council Member Rose to talk a little bit about her bill. Thank you, Speaker. Intro 1399 is the right to temporary changes in work schedule and the right to request flexible work without penalty. And I have to thank you for all of the machinations that we went through to get this bill to this stage. Unfortunately, emergencies happen to all people in all walks of life. While many New Yorkers are fortunate to have employers who understand this and make reasonable accommodations, a 2015 survey of New Yorkers revealed that 45% of respondents have no access to flexible work arrangements. 
and 58% of them feel uncomfortable or very uncomfortable asking for such changes. Intro 1399 would give all employees working in New York City the right to a temporary change in schedule twice a year to attend certain specific personal needs, such as a family caregiving situation, family offense matters, or sexual offenses, and the right to request any other changes in schedule without risking retaliation from their employer. This bill is especially important for early career, low income workers, nearly 70% of whom cannot change their schedule, start time or stop time if needed. Low wage workers, female workers, and workers of color disproportionately lack access to flexible work arrangements. No one should lose their livelihood for asking for an unpaid day to tend to an emergency. And that is what this bill ensures. The results of this bill should be positive for employees and employers alike, leading to a more satisfied and productive workforce. Employees with workplace flexibility are more likely to report better overall, overall job satisfaction, increased engagement with their job, fewer life interferences with job performance, improved physical health, improved mental health status, and a higher likelihood of remaining with their current employer. Many hours went into this legislation, which will ultimately help improve working conditions for thousands of low wage working women and men in New York City. It will make that a reality. I want to thank Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito and my colleague Brad Landa for their support. And I too want to say that I think this has been the most productive city council that we've had. I will be, I have been in this council eight years and um, the things that we were able to produce this term have been phenomenal and it's been through the leadership of Melissa Mark Viverito. Next council, um, we'll vote on legislation sponsored by council member Colombo, intro 1615A, require SBS to develop and make available to all contracting agencies a subcontractor resource guide. Going to all vote on, and I think, you know, seems to, uh, Van Kalos seems to have a permanent fixture here today. Uh, introduction 1486A, sponsored by Van Kalos, which would require the DOE to report the number of students who applied to, received an offer of admission for, and enrolled in schools in grades pre-K, kindergarten six and nine uh, in schools in each community school district as well as the anticipated number of school seats available in each school. Okay, thank you. Uh, council will also vote on intro 1497A sponsored by council member Rafael Salamanca which would require DOE to publish an annual report on students in temporary housing. The council will then vote on intro 1604A sponsored by council member Rosie Mendez which would require the mayor's office of operations or other agency designated by the mayor to review the official forms of certain designated city agencies to determine whether they are eligible to be updated to include voluntary questions regarding individuals' gender pronouns and if so, eligible to update such forms. Next, council will vote on intro 804A, sponsored by council member Inez Barron, which would require reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities under the New York City Human Rights Law. I'm especially proud of my final bills, of which I sponsored, obviously, intro 1499A would require the commissioners of D Disney, of uh, Department of Sanitation, and DCA to study the feasibility of a penalty mitigation program. Intro 1419A would allow the city to recover penalties for construction site safety violations that result in, an, in uh, or are accompanied by death or serious injury. And intro 1012A, which would amend the New York City Human Rights Law to improve its organizational structure and enhance its clarity. And finally, uh, the council is going to vote on what is commonly known as the Right to Know Act. During my years as a council member and now as speaker, we have engaged in numerous conversations with the NYPD, the administration, and the community in our efforts to reform public safety. Right before I became speaker, stop and frisk was at an all-time high. Four years later, this council has passed historic legislation like the Criminal Justice Reform Act to make this a more fair and just city. Right to know in its current form comes after hundreds of hours of negotiations with the advocates and NYPD. 
I want to thank Council Members Torres and Reynoso for their leadership and for their determination and hard work on both of these bills. Intro 182D, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, would require that all sworn police officers employed by the NYPD offer a business card to an individual during certain police interactions and give reason for the law enforcement activity. Intro 541C, sponsored by Council Member Antonio Reynoso, would require the NYPD to develop and provide guidance to its officers with respect to obtaining voluntary, knowing, and intelligent consent prior to conducting a search that is based solely on an individual's consent. I'd like to ask Council Member Torres to come up and say a few words, and then I'll ask Council Member Reynoso to do the same. Huh? Oh, okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, before I begin, I want to personally recognize Laura Popa, uh, Deepa uh, Ambakar, and Ramon Martinez for their incredible work and support uh, throughout this process. I want to thank our fearless leader, City Council Speaker Melissa Margarito, uh, una hermana. Muchas gracias por todo lo que ha hecho para nosotros. I really don't uh, believe all these accomplishments would have happened without your leadership. Um, the progress that we have made as a council over the last four years has been because of your vision and leadership. Uh, the road to bring the Right to Know Act to a vote has not been easy. Since being introduced in 2014, we have faced multiple roadblocks and challenges. However, we have pres persevered and pushed and pushed police reform to bring about justice. Intro 541 will increase transparency and accountability regarding unconstitutional searches um, or ones that have no legal basis. Uh, I will require consent to search during non emergency encounters. New Yorkers are often unaware that they have the right to refuse a search when an officer does not have legal justification for it. And even if they do uh, know their rights, they can often be uncomfortable or prohibited from exercising it because of fear of escalation by the officer. There is a power imbalance when you are being asked to empty out your pockets by someone with a gun. However, by increasing NYPD accountability and transparency, we can build trust between communities and the NYPD. For communities of color that are disproportionately affected by increase, uh, increased policing, this bill empowers us. It protects us and prevents discriminatory, discrimination based interactions with the police department. Uh, we need to defend ourselves against the Trump administration and their attacks on immigrant communities who are often the target of abusive policing. As local officials, we must enact reforms at the local level like this that help reduce unnecessary and abusive police interactions. This is what it means to be a sanctuary city. I want to thank the speaker again and her legislative team, as well as the mayor and his team for their support in the last two months to get this bill over the finish line. Uh, I would also like to thank the Progressive Caucus and the director, uh, Zara Nazir, for their early support of this bill, as well as Council Members Williams and Lander, who in 2013 set the bar with the Community Safety Act. I want to thank my staff and then my former legislative director, Lacey Tauber, who left my office just last week. Her work on this bill was instrumental. I'd also like to recognize all of my colleagues who, co I would like to represent, uh, recognize, especially one of my colleagues who helped co-sponsor this bill to advance social justice for the city of New York as well, Council Member Richie Torres, for his partnership throughout this process. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, Intro 182 has been the subject of some controversy, and I will make a, a lengthy case for the bill during stated, but now I want to underscore that everyday street encounters is not an abstraction to me. Right, I'm the youngest elected official of color in the city of New York. I grew up in the projects. I grew up in the Bronx. I, I'm not from an ivory tower, and I'm convinced from three years of negotiation and from my own lived experience that this, this bill will have a real impact in improving the day-to-day -day interactions between police and civilians. There have been, there has long, there has been for the past week a disinformation campaign against me personally, as well as against the legislation, and I want to address some of those myths. The first myth is that Intro 182 is a backroom deal. This is a lie. Intro 182 and Intro 541 were negotiated through the same process by the same negotiators in the same room. There was no special, secret, smoke-filled room in which Intro 182 was uniquely negotiated. 
Myth number two, I am doing the bidding of the New York City Police Department. This too is a lie. Intro 182 and Intro 541 are both products of painstaking negotiations with the NYPD, and it took three years to get the NYPD not to enthusiastically support, but to begrudgingly accept these bills as part of a hard-fought compromise. Myth number three, I am doing the bidding of the PBA to listen to some of the critics you would think I was a spy for the Police Benevolent Association. And for evidence, I would point no other than the words of Patrick Lynch, who once said of our bills, it's almost unthinkable that in our current environment that we would discourage police officers from proactively addressing the threats of crime and terrorism. But this is precisely what the right to know bills would accomplish. These two bills are harmful pieces of legislation that present a dangerous distraction from the very real threats to our city. These are hardly the words of a man who thinks I'm doing his bidding. Myth number four is that intro 182 guts protections. This too is a lie. Local law offers no safeguards for accountability and transparency in day-to-day -day police civilian interactions. Common sense dictates that you cannot gut protections that do not exist. Intro 182 creates new protections that will finally have the force of law. And then finally, myth number five, I am somehow playing politics. There are those who claim I'm making a political calculation. And I would ask those people, what political calculation exactly am I making? Because I will confess to you all that there is no political calculus by which I am making a remotely rational decision. The bill I'm advancing has no organized constituency. It faces hysterical opposition from both the PBA and CPR. Most members of the city council are far from eager to vote on any of these pieces of legislation. The mayor is far from eager to sign the bill. The NYPD is far from eager to implement the bill. Police reform, quite simply, is a hard issue that most in the political class would rather place on the back burner. So no one is truly happy here. If I were calculating politically, I would do nothing. Avoid creating controversy, make everyone happy, all the while protecting my progressive bona fides. Or if I were calculating politically, I would do the aggressive bidding of the advocates and become the darling of the progressive movement. But instead of calculating politically, I am doing what I believe is the right thing to do, politics notwithstanding. The compromise that we have before us is historic and hard fought. We all have searing memories of 2014 when there was an open revolt in the rank and file of the New York City Police Department. And so if we have an opportunity to pursue a path to police reform without provoking an upheaval in the New York City Police Department, then why not do it? Why not pursue police reform zealously but responsibly? And during the stated meeting, I will offer an extended case for my bill and the process by which I've decided to advance the bill. And I could not have asked for a better speaker to have my back uh, than Melissa Mark DeVerito. Uh, this has been the most challenging week of my political career. I've been the target of a never-ending stream of invective on Twitter and, and, and in person. But I believe what I'm doing is right, and I will defend what I'm doing, even if it means I stand alone, even if, I mean, if, even if it means I sever every political relationship that I have, because I believe in this bill, I believe it will move the ball forward, I believe it will set a precedent on which this council can build in the years to come. Thank you. And I'm proud to stand with you. Uh, I'm also excited, just before we close, and we'll do a couple of Spanish and take your questions, I'm excited to announce today that we are launching a new New York City Council legislative website. So this is obviously something for the next session. It's going to be located at laws.council.nyc.gov. NYC Councilmatic allows the public to more efficiently search the Council's legislative information and pulls its data directly from our legislative API. 
You can now sign up for notifications about specific issues, individual members, or meetings. This new site is interactive, I'm sorry, it's iterative, which means that the council will continue to improve it based on user feedback. I'm also proud to say that my tenure as speaker, we have transformed every single one of the council's digital assets. We have continued to focus on people over products, and this new tool aims to make it easier for everyday New Yorkers to access the council's legislative information, therefore making us more transparent. By adopting Councilmatic as an official government tool, we're continuing to demonstrate our commitment to transparency, access, and digital inclusion. I want to thank Council Members Kalos, Vaca, and Lander for their dedication to these issues, and to our partners, David Moore of the Participatory Politics Foundation, Beta NYC, and DataMade for pushing this project forward. And as we, uh, as this legislative session draws to a close, just once again, I want to thank all of my colleagues for being valuable partners these past four years. Um, I have taken this job extremely seriously, seen it as one where we are much more member focused, that I will stand and support and defend my colleagues and this institution. And I really hope that that carries forward. So um, I want to thank everyone who has stood by me along the way. Uh, I really look forward to seeing what the next council accomplishments accomplishes and know you will always have my support. So I want to uh, ask everyone, I mean, wish everyone happy holidays and a happy new year. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple of the things quickly in Spanish, and not all of them, because obviously there's a lot. Uh, hoy el Consejo Municipal de Nueva York votará lo que comuni comúnmente se conoce como el Acta del Derecho a Saber, requiriendo que los oficiales se identifiquen al público y requiriendo que el Departamento de Policía de Nueva York desarrolle y brinde orientación a sus oficiales para obtener consentimiento para requisar individuos. Luego el Consejo votará para fortalecer la Ley de Derechos Humanos. Um, eh, I'm just trying to see which ones I skip over. También el Consejo votará uh, sobre legislación que protege a los empleados que buscan cambios temporales a los horarios de trabajo para eventos personales y ciertos otros cambios de horario que, son, que surgen de manera de emergencia. Um, and I will leave it there. Just quickly, give me one second. Okay, and that's, I'll leave it there. And we can uh, go over and put the other stuff maybe online. Uh, so I'll stop there. And then I don't know if there's, we can start with the questions. This is by judge. This is the one yesterday. Right. Well, I mean, that was based on the, they were in court yesterday. Okay, so we can't. Um, what was he saying? Give me a quote. My understanding, that's not what was provided by the judge. It was an uh, injunction. Uh, let's be clear about a couple of things. Uh, who are these judges selected by? The Judge Tish is someone whose name was put forward by Keith Wright. And in our the arguments yesterday, it was pretty clear that this was not about the letter of the law, but politics. So I continue to stand by this or entity, this council, in that we have the ability to move forward in the way that we have done historically. Six commissioners of the BOE have been selected by this same process and that are sitting BOE commissioners at this moment. So we believe it's gonna be vindicated in court eventually. So we are, and I, it's, it's not about an individual, this is about reforming the Board of Elections, this is about putting in qualified candidates, this is about protecting a decision, independent decision, that these council members in the Manhattan delegation had the right to make. And I stand by that, and I'll continue to stand by that. So anyone's attempt to characterize this, I think I will put my ethical record and my integrity side by side with Keith Wright's any day.
This is again about not an individual, but about a process at which a decision was made. Six out of the commissioners at the Board of Elections have been uh, appointed in the same process that the members of the Manhattan delegation went through. We believe, again, that we will be vindicated in court. If that carries over into the next session, it carries over into the next session. This is about the institutional integrity of the New York City Council, of which I have fought for each and every day that I have, agree, uh, have been a council member and as a speaker defended, and I will continue to defend that moving forward. I am sure that the members will continue to defend that process as well and their right as an institution uh, to move forward. And again, this is about seriously needed reforms which a Department of Investigation report in 2013 uh, deemed was seriously overdue, and that unfortunately um, the process has to change by which some of these commissioners are elected. I've been summoned. Uh, so I will not be voting no on 182. I will be supporting Council Member Torres. Uh, uh, that, that press conference was also a celebration of the work that I've been able to do on 541 and the victories that we have as a council on that bill. I don't want it to be lost um, that uh, originally this was the controversial bill that was supposed to be pushed that was going to have a hard time to be passed. And Council Member Torres was with me the whole time. Um, and. Uh, I didn't want to take that away from the advocates either. They fought very hard for these pieces of legislation to be pushed forward, and uh, they were satisfied with the compromise we came about with 541. So I wanted to be able to celebrate that as well. Uh, I, don't, I think that we're losing sight of the fact that we have a bill here that is, uh, that's, gonna, that's universally supported, um, and that we don't only focus on the controversy at hand. And that seems to be the, the way business is done here. But again, 541 is something that's universally supported, and I wanted to celebrate that. Look, I mean, it could be the right thing to do. Right? We don't pass legislation based on the constituencies that support it, or we ought to pass legislation based on the merits and the impact it will have in the real world. And I feel it's going to move the ball forward in improving everyday street encounters between police and civilians, street encounters that I experienced as an adolescent, as an adult. The question is, how could I possibly not move forward with it? Right? What, what am I, the, the, the determination about the best way forward, those are determinations that should be made by elected officials. Right? If I'm going to give advocates veto power over the legislative priorities of the city council, then where do you draw the line? then why even have council members, right? Where do we get these notion that these organizations speak for the people instead of elected officials who were voted into our positions by the people to be trustees for the public good and to make good faith judgments about what's in the best interest of the public and when it's appropriate to move forward. So I refuse to cede my prerogatives as a legislator to advocacy organizations. They should have a seat at the table. They have no business asserting veto power over my legislative priorities. You said the first question, a specter. It, it, it's a recognition that we cannot implement our own laws, right? Leg, le legislation at the local level requires the buy-in of city agencies, right? And I have concluded that it's far more constructive to partner, to pursue reform in partnership with the NYPD than, than to do what is being asked of me and to go to political war with the NYPD and then risk a revolt. You know, if, if officers were to stop engaging from everyday policing, as they did for a period of time in 2014, it's my district that's affected. It's not Park Slope. It's my district and my constituents. On your second question, the, the bill requires that every officer 
provide a business card upon request in every single interaction. And then it requires officers to provide a business card proactively, regardless of request, in every level two, level three, and level four interaction. So that would include accusatory questioning, stop, question, and frisk, and searches, as well as consent searches. So if an officer approaches you and, and, and inquires, where's, where's, have you seen this missing cat? The officer is not required to provide you an identification. You can ask for one, and then he would be legally required. But if an officer treats you as if, he, if, as if you're a criminal suspect, he would be required to turn on his body camera, identify himself with a business card, and then explain the reason for an encounter. Ah. As of Saturday, congratulations, Council Member. What's his name? Alejandro. Alejandro. Oh my God. Uh, three fingers. Yes. Bueno, yo, o sea, yo estoy sumamente orgullosa de tener una, un, eh, con mi, eh, el apoyo de mis colegas de el primero de enero salir de, de este cuerpo legislativo con eh, ser el cuerpo legislativo más productivo en la historia de este consejo municipal. Hay leyes que hemos eh, adelantado que van a beneficiar a comunidades eh, que históricamente han sido enajenadas. Eh, yo estoy orgullosa del trabajo que he sido como luchadora por las comunidades inmigrantes. Eh, y le doy las gracias a todos los que siempre me han demostrado su amor y su apoyo porque me lo han dicho eh, cuando yo estoy viajando a través de la ciudad. Eh, ¿Cuántas veces inmigrantes que me paran y me dan las gracias por ser una voz por ellos, por, para traerle dignidad, que no son invisibles, que son personas a quien debemos respetar y que están aportando positivamente a nuestra ciudad? Eh, así que o sea, yo salgo, o sea, no... He logrado todo lo que he querido, pero yo no tengo, eh, yo no tengo razón por la cual quejarme. ¿no? Yo, yo sé que esta ciudad es una mejor ciudad por el trabajo que hemos he hecho nosotros eh, y que yo he liderado. Eh, así que yo quiero que eso siga hacia adelante. O sea, yo quiero que esta si ciudad siga siendo una ciudad santuaria, en verdad que este, este, sigamos luchando eh, y, y adelantando proyectos de ley que van a seguir apoyando a nuestras comunidades inmigrantes en particular y reformar el sistema de justicia en esta ciudad. Sí, claro. Eso, bueno, la resolución, eh, la que o sea, nosotros vamos a adoptar, es, es una eh, reconoce los valores que nosotros tenemos. Que so, nosotros, eh, el que está hablando de, de que se pase un sí, es para, para decir que nosotros como ciudad estamos pidiendo que ese proyecto de ley se pase al nivel federal, eh, que estamos viendo que parece que no se va a dar, es una pena, eh, y también al nivel estatal, aunque... Eh, el del nivel estatal no, no tiene tanta seguridad, pero por lo menos es un mensaje clave de lo que estamos mandando como, ci como ciudad y como Estado si se pasa y adopta ese proyecto de ley a nivel estatal. I'm a stoic person. I think where I get emotional is where, I, you know, I was interviewed yesterday. It's like when I think of, of um, people that are so humble and have so little that thank me and literally give of themselves in a way uh, that it just takes your breath away, you know, that they feel so much that you've brought them some dignity and that you have a voice. And I'm talk talk talking particularly about immigrants. Um, that it just moves me, you know, and it just shows me why I do this work and that this, you know, the things we do, we do because we believe it's the right thing to do. Uh, and so, you know, I, it's, it's a day, you know, I want to thank my colleagues. I'll, you know, hopefully they'll be thanking me on the floor. <laughs> but, you know, I, 
I appreciate their partnership because I could not have done this without them. And uh, we're our better city because of the contributions of this legislative session. And uh, after um, having been under 20 years of Republican rule, and so I'm proud of that and, and proud of uh, what's in store for this council moving forward. Thank you. Thank you.